Databases. A database seminar series at Carnegie Mellon University is recorded in front of a live studio audience. Funding for this program is made possible by Ottertune. Google. Hi guys, uh, welcome to another uh, data seminar for Carnegie Mellon. Uh, we're excited today to have Andre Borodin. Uh, he is a brand new engineer at Amazon. Uh, but prior to this, he was at Yandex, where he built the uh, the Odyssey proxy that he's going to talk about today. Uh, so in addition to this, he's also a Postgres and Greenplum contributor, and he has a PhD in computer science. So Andre, thank you so much for being here. The floor is yours. And I guess you for the audience, if you have any questions for Andre as he's going along, just unmute yourself and ask questions anytime. So this will be a conversation for him and not uh, him talking by himself over Zoom for an hour. So Andre, the floor is yours. You have an hour. Go for it. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Andre. I am Postgres hacker, Postgres developer, and I'm all, all in open source for a long time. Was um, And today we are going to talk about Odyssey. This is a connect, uh, Postgres connection puller. Uh, here is a team behind Odyssey. Odyssey is purely open source project. You can use it for whatever purposes you like. Just don't see us. Uh, this is not all uh, contributors that I remember at all. Uh, on the left, you can see Dmitry Simonenko. He designed the overall architecture. Uh, on the center is Kirill Ryshke. He designed most hardcore features and uh, some performance tuning. And on the right side, it's me. I was primarily responsible for rolling out and seeing production and fixing uh, unpredictable stuff that happened there. Uh, a few words about me. I'm contributing to Postgres since 2016. My first patch was committed uh, that year in Postgres 10. Uh, I maintain uh, open source projects. Some of them are stable and in productions. I'm just your research projects, and I know which one is which. Uh, Odyssey was developed uh, for Yandex services that were based on Postgres. For example, uh, Yandex serves uh, mailboxes for half a billion mailboxes. Uh, I have no idea how much active users are there, but someone has more than one mailbox. Uh, but uh, the workload is about 1 million requests per second to the database, and it, it's quite stable for already like some years. Also, there is a Yandex Cloud for other services uh, where we have some like something like 10 petabytes of all. I don't know exact figures right now since I'm uh, Yandex employee, but it must be on, on the same scale. A uh, typical cluster that uh, we used is a cluster of uh, some, usually three uh, replica nodes. Oh. is a primary node and two quorum replication standby nodes. Uh, replication standby nodes usually serve read-only uh, read workload while, while changing mutating transactions go through primary node. We never do uh, analytics on uh, Postgres, we are using logical application to copy the data to ClickHouse or Greenplum or uh, or some other systems that we use. And we collect right ahead logs and backups to uh, our S3 implementation. And let me make a bold statement. Uh, it's like maybe too bold for me, but still every most of Postgres installations used for need some connection pro proxy. This is a problem of Postgres. It must be solved. Like if you're designing your own service with Postgres, you can start it right away. But when the service becomes loaded, you need something that stands between your driver and Postgres database. Why so? How how happened? How happened that uh, we need? some proxy tools. Uh, let's check out fresh Postgres out of, of, out of JIT and run PGB, PGBench. 
Uh, here you can see that uh, we run 10,000 10, connections. Uh, I used uh, just random virtual machine with eight cores and got 86 seconds. This is, a, I don't know, abysmal. This is very small. Uh, and the easiest way to tune the stuff is to just reduce concurrency. If we reduce concurrency to 1,000 of active clients, we see that now we have 500 transactions per second. Going further, and we like we have some sensible uh, performance of a cluster. We can tune a lot more. This is a, not where you should stop. This is an out-of-box configuration when nothing was tuned. But just reducing the concurrency bring uh, order of magnitude more performance. How does it happen? As this is a, a heritage of uh, Postgres architecture. Uh, one server connection, which is called one backend, is a one Unix process. Uh, if for some reason it crashes, uh, it can even not crash the whole database. This is a kind of installation. Uh, but the cost, what cost that it uh, brings is that uh, this process for each connection have its own cache of relation. It, it knows some uh, tables, its columns and types of its columns. Uh, it have a, it, its own cache of compiled PLPG SQL statements. Uh, it, it have uh, its own cache uh, of query plans. So all caches, not all, but most of caches are tied to backend cache. Uh, also we use for half fencing, but let's keep it for now. Uh, when we, we move on, we see that uh, inside uh, the Postgres core, uh, many algorithms depends linearly on a number of active connections. For example, here a small snippet of taking a, a MVCC snapshot, which just process through whole so-called proc array, uh, array of uh, every array of connections, checks if the connection is active, if it's active, analyzes its states. Uh, so we pre-allocate this array on the start of Postmaster. Uh, memory consumed by uh, each connection is pre-allocated upon the start. And many, many small algorithms depends on the, on the size of a proc array. That's why we always want to make proc array smaller to uh, make these algorithms faster. Community recognizes this is a problem. Uh, for example, in 2020, Andres Freund uh, from Microsoft make a huge effort to make Postgres uh, more scalable in terms of uh, standby care. In terms of, uh, you can read his blog post on uh, making idle connection uh, less affect, uh, affect performance less. Let's check out uh, some charts from his blog post. Uh, first thing that you can see here is that uh, one Postgres box at optimal workload can serve up to 2 million queries per second. This is a lot, actually. Uh, this is uh, 2 million read-only transactions per second, 2 million querying of snapshots, uh, 2 million index scans, and then heap scans in one virtual machine with uh, 72 virtual CPUs. Uh, Yet we see that uh, performance degrades uh, even with before uh, Postgres 14, uh, performance degrades even with simply adding uh, idle connections, connections that do not do anything. And uh, to quantify things, we can say that performance of 1,000 oh, 10, idle connections is uh, at least three times lower than performance of 100 uh, server connections. And this is repeated in many blog posts. For example, this is a blog post by Dracona, where they used different uh, benchmark tool, Sysbench, which can be more close to, to different workloads, just different workloads. And here we see that uh, with uh, some kind of connection pooling, we have a reasonable and stable uh, performance, but without puller in some cases, we get much better performance. 
so basic idea of connection pooling is to reducing concurrency within the database uh, closer to some global optimum and on some benchmarks we observe that this global optimum really exists uh, this is a benchmark from unrelated patch but it was uh, done in a cut of a number of concurrent clients and uh, we clearly see here that uh, concurrency around the number of cpus is optimal for a database uh, this, 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 this is not always the case uh, where uh, benchmarks uh, with uh, more than 100 of cpus for postgres show that concurrency is still somewhere uh, around uh, less than 100 uh, active concurrent uh, queries active concurrent transactions but since change when we move from uh, in memory workload to some disk based workload uh, this chart shifts to the right and some optimum is usually achieved uh, around three to four hundred of concurrent backends i think this is connected to qd learn devices but still it looks the same you have some optimum and then decline of performance uh, this is a just uh, pure benchmark stuff but when things get real uh, is that uh, there is no such thing as homogeneous workload uh, usually you have some different uh, microservices that are asking the uh, database different queries and this is kind of isolation for uh, for your service kind of isolation of your application you have uh, a small service that is not very important which you limit for about 10 uh, concurrent queries and then you have a big business critical service which is super important for your business and you limit it in 200 uh, concurrent questions why usually we do this because uh, one small microservice sh should not be able to kill entire production it can consume all its resources all its database quota and we don't have another uh, mechanics to co uh, quote quote uh, performance of some microservices uh, and uh, thus with this isolation we pr protect uh, microservices from each other isolate it, it from, from each other uh, and these uh, services are still uh, dba driven you need some smart uh, dba who knows which service is critical which is not uh, this service will perform better with uh, like 50 active concurrent connection and this service is just based and you need uh, 500 uh, con uh, concurrent connections and they don't interfere with working set but that's rare that really happens uh the solution uh, to, the, to the number of actively concurrent uh, uh, queries uh is to be found yet uh typically if you use out of the box proxy you have error based concurrency limit what does it mean when the application is uh, querying a database it first obtains a connection if uh, it's an unlucky pass, it will get it from a uh, application side pool. If it's not, it will have to establish new connection to the database if the pool is empty. Uh, ask a query, commit the query, and if something failed, uh, we need to have a back off period to wait and then retry it from the beginning. Acquire a new connection and uh, rerun a query. Any LTP uh, application must be prepared to retry connection, uh, retry both connection and query uh seeing as uh, small interruptions of network connectivity happen all uh, here and there and any application that do not uh, retry queries to the database uh, can be very um, very sensitive to network out uh, transient network out of this this is that's the place where is designed uh the um error based concurrence limit but it doesn't work well in practice because uh, developers usually just forget to add this uh, retry 
where can we pull connections? Where can we uh, allocate some connections on advance and uh, limit usage, uh, the limit the number of uh, concurrently used connection? Easiest way is to use just application side pooling. Uh, use the driver which uh, have its own connection pool on the client side. Another option is to use uh, some proxy which is uh, connecting lots of client queries into a small number of server processes. And finally, uh, there is ongoing work on making uh, built-in pooling. Uh, for example, in MySQL, you have enterprise uh, version with a connection pooler built-in. In Postgres, we wanted to, but for last two years, the work was not very active and advanced, advancement of a scaling usual connections, but by um, Andres Freund were uh, more impressive than built-in connection pooling. If you have client side, yeah. What are those numbers? One, two, four, seven. What, what are those? Is those mean anything there or? <laughs> no, uh, this is just bitwise combination of uh, oh. three previous. Yes, yes, yes. Yep, I got it. Because in in practice, usually you have uh, some layers of proxies, and you still have to use application side uh, pooling, and some users use uh, built-in. For example, if you are using proprietary and um, Postgres Pro, uh, you have this built-in pooling already there. And in some cases, uh, you have three pooling in, in the same time. Got it. I, understand. But, I mean, maybe you're talking about this. But actually, yeah, you're going to go through it all. Keep going. Sorry. No problem. Uh, if you have application side pooling, everything just works. This is the first step uh, when you encounter uh problem with uh, database connectivity you just enable your applic application side pooling and everything continues to scale good or okay uh, but at some point uh, in time you see that now application backend is a single point of failure it's stateless and you can just simply add more backends same thing happens when you have uh, microservices e each microservice have number of backends, each backend have a number of uh, connection pools, each pool have number of connections. Then you understand that now uh, one data point of handler and you go to multiple availability zones. And uh, now you have a lot of scaling Stateless backend, stateless backend uh, create a lot of idle connections that can be concurrent sometimes, but uh, they can affect performance. Uh, but the, their sole purpose is to uh, be prepared to switch workload from one availability zone to another availability zone. And finally, uh, when you have sharded Postgres, uh, you have some application side sharding which decides to which shard you go. Uh, you can end up with thousands and tens of thousands of uh, server connections. For example, uh, in Yandex Mail, one shard currently is utilizing up to 30,000 uh, concurrent TCP connection inbound. Uh, let's get back to this slide where I was establishing 10,000 connections to, to the local Postgres. Uh, you can see that establishment of these uh, 10,000 connections, connections took uh, 15 seconds, 15 CPU seconds. This is a lot, this is eight cores. So um, if we have like 30,000 inbound connection and some network switch is rebooted, we have to re-establish 30,000 new connections and it cost us simply 10 minutes of CPU time due to some small network glitch. Uh, and this is kind of frustrating. And we how didn't often, encrypt anything yet. What? How, how often does that happen? Uh, how uh, network I mean, connection can be broken? Some, I mean, like, 
Yeah. For yeah, example, he, in your experience at Yandex, was it like a once a minute, once an hour, once a day? Um, some switches are upgraded, uh, and when their firmware is upgraded, uh, this is, can happen quite quite often. Uh, okay. Firmwares were upgraded like once in a month. Um, I think there is a uh, some I, I a certification process that requires that firmware must be upgraded once in four weeks or so. So uh, when the firmware upgraded, the switch is rebooted. Usually it, re it is rebooted in waves. Uh, so it's not the whole data centers go down and then it's it has to restore all its connections. But single database still suffer from uh, this uh, network connectivity problems. Uh, there are some other sources of uh, upgrades uh, so, uh, on, on a wave from a client to the server. And uh, sometimes we have a connection between availability zones uh, which goes through external internet and external internet simply unpredictable. Someone can just unplug the uh, link and plug it back and all the connections are gone. Gotcha. Uh, uh, what is the cost of having one uh, server connection? Uh, first of all, when you're going through the open internet, you have to have an encrypted connection and start of encryption takes up, up to 100 of milliseconds of cryptography. If you have some very good CPU cores, you can reduce it to maybe 15 or even 10 uh, milliseconds of cryptography uh, workload, but still it's it's a lot of, C of CPU time. Uh, when you connect to out of the box Postgres, you have to call fork with uh, subsequent page faults in a newly forked Postgres. And yes, it can consume up to 100 milliseconds of CPU time again. This will be mostly idle CPU stored in page faults uh, or in system calls, but it will still cost you some mm, performance, uh, performance degradation. Finally, not finally, but next, uh, having, having server connection cost you small epsilon cost on each transaction because uh, internal Postgres structures became uh, bigger. And finally, it's very cache friendly copy of a system catalog in every single backend if, if the number of backends is in thousand of backend, thousands of backends. What to do with it? The basic idea is that uh, Postgres protocol is very simple. You have a message protocol, messages fly from uh, front end to the backend and uh, vice versa. Uh, you can issue a simple query, uh, return some data rows and uh, uh, invitation for the next query, which is called ready for query. Uh, in pipeline mode, you can query even before getting ready for query. You can issue some queries and get some results uh, interleaved by ready for query uh, messages. Uh, this ready for query message can contains one bit. Are you in transaction or are you not in transaction? Uh, if you are not in transaction, you are feel free to just use the server connection to serve some others, some other clients workload. And uh, these small bits allows uh, all the proxy pullers that exist right now. Uh, there is a plenty of different uh, proxy pullers like pool 2 which which is a good tool but it solves too much of different uh, different problems and attacking by uh, attacking many problems um, didn't end well on our benchmarks crunchy proxies this is a not very commonly used proxy written in go and uh, it's easy to study what's in it pg bouncer is de facto standard uh, most of uh, cloud providers uh, more or less give you a PG bouncer based uh, Postgres clusters. Also, there are some newcomers like PG Cat and this PQR, and I will touch it at the end. Uh, after choosing Puller in 2015, we decided that PG bouncer is the best for us. This is this was seven years ago. Time flies. Uh, but 
PG Bouncer was not perfect. We saw a lot of problems. First, you need to teach your, your developers not to use uh, stuff that survives through transaction boundaries. For example, temporary tables or advisory logs do not survive this. And also, uh, you have some session parameters like timeouts and uh, some mass parameters and culture parameters like the time and the currency, etc. cetera. Uh, all this stuff, uh, if you change uh, like decimal separator, for example, in uh, Western culture, you use dot. In uh, some Eastern cultures, you, you use comma to separate a uh, fraction from an uh, integer. And if you change uh, something in, uh, in transaction pooling mode, uh, someone is getting your server connection with unexpectedly changed decimal separator. <laughs> but this all is solvable and uh, some pullers work well with session parameters, yet temporary tables, advisory logs and prepared statements are the problem for uh, transaction pooling. And this is the main problem why not every installation is using PG Bouncer. PG Bouncer is open source, which is cool uh, and it's hard to find someone to pay it for advancing, advancing it. Uh, for many years, it was not very actively development, uh, developed. Uh, recently, uh, Peter Eisentraut and Joel Stenema done a good job in moving uh, PG Balancer forward. But at the time of the beginning of Odyssey, we saw that uh, no new versions were happening. Uh, PG Bouncer connections still cost, cost us some uh, CPUs. When we connect to PG Bouncer, we have to uh, the last handshake, which is not free. And PG Bouncer process these connections in first in, first out manner. And clients uh, impose three seconds uh, connection timeout. What does it mean? That uh, when your network switch is rebooted, uh, from time to time, you see a wave of incoming TLS connections. Uh, they are limited by three seconds and processed in parallel. There may happen this situation where no one can just get in. This is uh, some uh, monitoring charts uh, from, a, from an incident when uh, you, we connect to the um, server, we see that all the CPU is consumed by PG Bouncer, and this CPU is purely uh, cryptographic stuff, uh, which we cannot optimize. It's already uh, quite good optimized uh, AVX assembler. And the correct, uh, in the correct solution for this problem is that when we have a, a more than 100% of utilization, we must inverse priorities. We must limit uh, our TLS handshakes and process first uh, clients that arrive at last because they have a bit better chance of surviving through connection timeout. And uh, for some reason, we choose another option. We decided that we need just more PG bouncers. Uh, we can just create a high availability proxy, which is, uh, it's already proxy. It proxies traffic through many PG bouncers and then to, to Postgres. Uh, this solution did work well because her proxy did not understand uh, Postgres protocol well and sometimes uh, used too much of PG Bouncer connections too. The next solution we used was uh, port reuse, which is, uh, by the way, is currently committed into PG Bouncer. It was committed year year or so ago, and uh, uh, you just uh, start many PG Bouncer on the same. TCP port, and then uh, operating system is responsible for uh, accepting new TCP connections by different processes. And it worked quite well, but if the one of PG Bouncer is overloaded with something, it is not accepting new TCP connections. So it may happen that one PG Bouncer 
accept a lot more connections than others because others were thinking about something or were busy at the time when a new wave of TCP connections arrived. Uh, we worked uh, with this setup for quite a long time, uh, but at some point we understood then that uh, we need too much of PG bouncers and three PG bouncers is just not enough. Uh, we use a two level cascading system. When we have a external uh, array of PG bouncer processes, internal array of PG bouncer processes, and only then we have uh, Postgres. And in some cases, it is still not enough. You can you are see here that 16 PG bouncer processes utilize its CPUs totally. I've heard that uh, Skype uh, or some other big big tech company uh, we're using three layers of pitch bouncers but we understood that this is just enough we have to create <laughs> new software uh scaling of pitch bouncers were really hard to maintain uh, there were other problems for example uh if pitch bouncer is running some uh, heavy workload against the database and for some reason all client connections are lost uh, PG Bouncer with, will wait until every query is actually executed. There was a, a pull request to solve this problem, to just issue a cancel of queries. And this pull request was ignored for some years. And uh, this was another point to just start a new thing. And finally, we have a long list of features that we want. And basically, we were building a cloud solution. Uh, and configs of PG Bouncer didn't fit in the cl cloud requirements. Uh, how a DCA start? This is all the problems that led us to uh, building a DCA, and all these problems must be solved now in a DCA. Not must, they are solved. Uh, from Bird's Eye overview, we can say that we support two platforms, uh, both Linux on uh, AMD64 and ARM64. Uh, it, Odyssey is pure C project. We do not uh, use any C++. Uh, and uh, we have almost no dependencies. All code is uh, handwritten, except uh, Uh, and also now we depend on Postgres itself because we use uh, Scrum authentication from Postgres because we don't like home don't don't like homemade cryptography. Uh, there is a small portion of uh, assembler code uh, that's why we are not purely C code, uh, but I will touch on this later. And Odyssey contains uh, two main building uh, blocks. One is Machinarium and one other is Kiwi. What is Machinarium? Machinarium is a cooperative uh, concurrency framework. Mm, why, why did it happen? Uh, if you see a code of, uh, see that it's basically a state machine. It remembers uh, what is the state of client, what is the state of, uh, server connection and have a table what to do if next byte arrived. For example, if we don't have a server uh, bound to the client, next byte of a, a client connection arrived, we must send this byte to someone, thus we acquire a new server connection. If there are no server connections, uh, we are opening new server connections and we change in our state that uh, client data arrived, opening server connections and then sleep until next uh, IO uh, happens, until next byte from the server will arrive. Uh, to understand what is the uh, client flow for, for the connection uh, and the way that um, client uh, flow is described sequentially as if it uh, um, but when it, its state has to be remembered and uh, sleep should be called until next IO event, it just issues machine sleep or machine syscalls 
which notifies the machinarium that uh, if new bytes arrive, uh, uh, woke me at the same uh, code place where I was uh, previously. That's why we have this uh, assembler code, which is called context swap, which basically uh, saves current stack of uh, of uh, front end of a client connection and swaps uh, call stack uh, with a system machinarium call stack. Uh, basically, machinarium allows uh, server thread, uh, which is responsible for waking up uh, its it back uh, without using system calls. We avoid uh, context swap using syscalls, uh, and we avoid using uh, server processes to do uh, multitasking. And on top of Machinarium, we have a Kiwi library. Kiwi is basically a library to format Postgres messages. Uh, for example, if you want a startup process, this is a bunch of bytes. To compose these bytes from uh, uh, parameters, we are using Kiwi library, which is doing just this. Uh, overall architecture using these libraries looks like this. We have a uh, system thread, uh, which is uh, governing uh, work, go go governing other threads, and this is calling TCP accept. And after accepting TCP connection, before starting any TLS connection, it is bounding uh, client connection to some uh, what is called machine or uh, machine or just system uh, process and. Uh, this process subscribes to each uh, subscribes to IO events using EPOL uh, and is in, in is in response to wake up uh, execution of a front end code of each client. Also, main thread is responsible for retiring old server connections and uh, running queries on a console database. Some words about multitasking. Uh, basically, each uh, operating system thread, uh, which is called uh, machine in machinarium, uh, have its own context of uh, of file descriptors that it must uh, be in, in response of. Hmm. Didn't sound uh, very clear, but that's all. No, I, I got to keep going. Okay. Uh, we are doing accepting in a separate thread. Why are we doing this? Because uh, we are trying to solve a problem that we observed in uh, PG Bouncer. Uh, we must distribute uh, new connections evenly among all uh, of our uh, machines uh, when some uh, machine is accepting just connections at the, at the beginning and then is overloaded unfortunately currently we don't know how how much each, each machine is overloaded so for example if you follow some pattern like open four connections close three open four connections, close three, open four, close three, et cetera, uh, and have four uh, machines, all, all the traffic will still go through through the same machine. Uh, it's not solved yet, but uh, we did not observe a problem with this in production. Uh, we are trying hard to pull, uh, to pack many small packets that arrive uh, one after another uh, into one big packet because the protocol allows it. Uh, it created some problems with driver, which did not uh, expect that many packets are arriving together in one packet, but that's not our problem, basically, as long as we adhere, adhere to Postgres protocol. And we are trying to connect a client always to the same server connection, if possible. Uh, if the server connection is busy, busy, we have to give another server connection to the client. 
also we solve the problem of constant queries and this is not always um, I, I i'm not sure if i would redo odyssey from the start and queries is a feature because sometimes you are considering queries that are almost about to to succeed and cancel postgres is creating yet new fork of postmaster if you have to cancel some uh, a lot of small queries you create new wave of forks to uh, accept uh, cancel uh, requests on the postgres sites so canceling sometimes saves you from incidents but sometimes it creates new incidents and you never know um, which one is more disastrous for a workload. Uh, also, physical replication and logical replication passes seamlessly through the uh, Odyssey. Um, and uh, we are 100% the uh, administrative tools of PG balancers like show server, show pools, show stats. Uh, we, are, we are showing the same, except that we are not reporting average uh, queries per second, we are reporting uh, quant quantiles of uh, like 99 quant uh, per percentile of uh, query timings and other uh, percentiles. Uh, also, we have some um, somewhat enhanced transaction processing and uh, essentially it means that we support protocol level prepared statements for example uh, you can have a typical workflow of executing query in following packets parse a query then you bind the query to some uh, parameters then you ask the server to describe what is the result uh, execute and close uh, open portal and think like, tell me all that you have, all, all the results that you have. And uh, planning happens when you parse uh, query, G generic planning, there are some different kind, kinds of plans, but generic plans happen at parse time. And then you can just issue multiple parameters to the same uh, prepared statement. Uh, and this saves you time to parse this, uh, uh, parse um, query, but it's not in, uh, about just time of a parsing. Uh, parse actually verifies your query against system catalog. It checks that uh, you are using uh, operators that do exist. It checks that you have uh, columns of tables that are correct as long as your snapshot. It checks that. Uh, system catalog was not invalidated just before and indexes were not concurrently rebuilt. So actually this parse is a, um, usually like a half of a workload uh, timing in, in, uh, in is, uh, Andre, you, you, you got distorted. You said it's half, it's half the workload time and then, and then I missed what you said after that. Uh, about, the, about parts uh prepared statements are uh, they survive through the transaction boundaries when the transaction ended uh they still leave that's why prepared statements are not compatible with the transaction pooling uh, if you run pg bench uh like default benchmarking tool against uh pg bouncer in prepared statement modes mode it will just work because every single connection will prepare the same number of uh, prepared statements and call it with the same names uh, real drivers do not do it uh, what we, uh, and the problem is uh, this different uh, sql statements can have can have the same name in different server connections like uh, one client is uh, preparing x as select one another client is preparing x as select two and first client getting second server and uh, getting two instead of one and uh, this is like uh, no, no, no error uh, to solve this problem we have two hash tables one hash table uh, is translating client prepared statement name to sql name another hash table can 
can uh, translate SQL hash name to server hash, uh, prepared, prepared statement. And when the client tells Odyssey, parse this SQL statement, we just don't do anything. Like we remember that this uh, statement was requested, but we, no, we do not actually prepare it anywhere. And when the client tells us, okay, it's time to bind uh, prepared statement to parameters, uh, we have a server connection and uh, if not, we pre issue prepare in this time. And this is, was uh, like changing in uh, logic of Odyssey because before this, we were just connecting uh, one, just sending the same bytes that we received from the client. And now we are rewriting protocol uh, to uh, to squeeze some more performance from the same machine. Uh, the problems of uh, this uh, approach, it's, it's current in production in some services, uh, server prepared statements, prepared statements are allocated forever in server uh, connection. Fortunately, we don't uh, allow server connection to live forever. To avoid cache bloat, Odyssey closes server connections in one hour or so. So if you have a flood of prepared statement, statements, uh, they will decay no longer than one hour from, from uh, right now. And uh, mapping this to some canonical hash and from canonical hash to server in, uh, implementation consume memory and no much, not so much we can do with this. And hashing uh, takes some time, but this time is still much less than planning a query. And the last feature that we added to Odyssey is the standby lock porting. Uh, as you may know, uh, standby replicas of Postgres can show you stale data. This is a tricky question because sometimes they show you data from the future. Like a replica can have uh, some data that did not happen, uh, that is still locked on primary yet. And can you show data from, from uh, too much of the past? And typical uh, way to solve, uh, to decide where you go uh, is defining in connection string many uh, addresses and uh, specifying level of your connection you can say any uh, node or uh, primary node or read write node and primary and read write is the same uh, but some have stole uh, lagging replica for example it was disconnected for uh, for a cluster for time partitioning uh, or it could be rebooted like virtual machine was gone, or uh, you have a RAID array that is not really good in current situation. For example, uh, one is the disk is broken and it's resyncing its array and uh, lagging Postgres replica happens now and then. And you don't want to observe too old data. For most applications, it's okay if you have uh, like one second lag or few hundred milliseconds lag, uh, but having lag more than a second is uh, usually is very undesired for, um, for an application. So in Odyssey, you can specify a watchdog query. Uh, and the, if this uh, watchdog query returns some value that is not acceptable to, to the user, for example, here we uh, tells that we we are okay if we have uh, 10 seconds lag and we can wait for 10 seconds until replica will catch up. Uh, if this doesn't work, the client will retry and retry will uh, give, uh, give the another replica. Uh, this allows uh, to see not to stale data, but this is a not real solution for consistency as you understand. Uh, you still observe some stale data, but not that stale. And for some 
uh, some of uh, applications is just okay. Uh, this is uh, currently in production version. We are developing some new functionality, but uh, it's working progressively. Uh, last uh, version was developed main, mainly by Kirill. Usually he is looking more like this. And I'm just hoping to review all the code he is implementing every day. <laughs> His passion allows us to move fast. Uh, despite being a five-year-old project. Uh, we have some questions that we don't know how to solve. And the most important for us question is question for looking for some optimum workload. Like if you are creating a cluster in Yandex Cloud, you have to specify uh, some magic number uh, for each user, number of concurrent connections. And how do you know this? I have no idea. We, we are trying to find it in, in a way that we do not allocate all connections simultaneously. This is just uh, one question problem. Should we open new connection now or should we, uh, should we wait for some time? Maybe we will we'll have some new server connection available for, for the query. And uh, uh, the magic number from the user say 1000 server connections easily is the limit uh, and uh, first half of this 500 we are allocating in parallel new query wants uh, new server connection we are just firing new server connections this is a, this allows us to ramp up quickly to uh, get some new server connections when they are necessary but when we reach the center of a uh, of this magic number, we are starting to delay request for new server connections. And, and at the end, when you reach this magic number, we have uh, connection which will be allocated, uh, which will be free for queries. Uh, but it's still all about the user. Uh, and user have to uh, solve this multi-dimensional optimum problem every his microservice. Another problem that we won't uh, solve one day uh, in Odyssey, but didn't solve it yet. Uh, this is a read after write consistency. Uh, very simple idea that uh, when we are writing to po uh, primary Postgres node, uh, we can get LSN of our commit uh, logical sequence number in write ahead log that uh, when our transaction was committed and uh, when we are getting a query from a client, he is returning us this LSN. And if, if this LSN uh, uh, standby node, we allow the client to see his own changes. Um, this is uh, like, I'd say it's not even work in progress, it's idea in progress. We had a lot of discussion, but uh, so far we did not implement it yet. And does, the process wire, does the process wire protocol you support this read write tokens? Uh, why the Postgres protocol do not support it? I, I'm asking, does it? I don't know. Yeah, uh, the basic idea, not, not basic idea, the basic problem is that no one did, did implement it. Just did a new, new type of like, message. Yes. The, the podcast wire protocol currently does not support read by tokens. Got it. That's what I thought. This, this, this protocol, do, uh, so far, protocol do not support it. It's quite easy to edit uh, in the protocol, but uh, it will take some time to discuss with the community. So you, you yeah. just need uh, one extra uh, message before returning ready for query. There is already a message that is called command complete, and you can follow it command complete with following LSN. And have LSN of your transaction, you can return. And get it to the primary node. You can, if you have this LSM, you can roll to some 
probably stolen, but okay, uh, not, not, not that far uh, known. Uh, and another thing that we simply don't have is a protocol compression. Uh, currently, Postgres protocol is not compressed, mainly due to the fact that we are afraid of crime attacks. Currently, uh, there is a thread uh, in Postgres hackers with implementation of protocol compression. And in fact, Odyssey supports this protocol. So if this protocol will ever be uh, adopted, we already have a code that uh, compresses the data between client and server, and also compresses the data between uh, primary and standby. This is the, three times more of a traffic than from a client to the server. Uh, but to, to actually use this code that already is implemented and tested, uh, we need to um, agree with the community on what protocol is. Uh, there is uh, another attempt to, to make a sharding via lightweight proxies. And uh, if you see that, uh, if you look at uh, currently existing sharding solution for Postgres, you will find that they are based on custom pl uh, plan node, which decides which shard to roll to. For example, Citus is working this that way, and substantial part of uh, time consumed by uh, routing is a checking the query against system catalog. For example, in TPC C benchmarks, you are creating temporary tables. These temporary tables invalidates other backend rel caches and sys caches. Uh, that's why uh, Postgres is not scaling well in TPCC in pure. Uh, if you are going through a router, which must check uh, its validity against system catalog. Uh, but this is uh, the router, which is query, uh, routing the query to just one shard, can be completely stateless. Uh, and in fact, at a rate very resemblant to Odyssey. Odyssey is written on low level uh, C and uh, eventually we will do sharding uh, in Odyssey too. But we understood this is just uh, too much of a dirty prototyping and we do not know exactly how we want it to operate. That's why we created a copy of Odyssey in Go, which is called SPQR. Surprisingly, it is not working much slower than C version of Odyssey. Uh, and the only difference is that SPQR uh, have its routing part. You can specify many uh, server connections uh, that are uh, associated with different ranges of some sharding keys. Uh, but today it's only a prototyping stage. It's not in production anywhere. And we are experimenting here and there, and maybe things will change. Uh, fortunately, there is a one concurrent project which is doing exactly the same, but in Rust, if you don't like Go and want to do some lightweight proxy sharding, you can look at PGCAT. Uh, this is absolutely brilliant project and it's really developed fast uh, by a team. Uh, the ported only explicit sharding when you have to say to which shard you want puller to connect you to. Uh, but now, maybe a week ago or so, they implemented automatic sharding. They are really fast. <laughs> I think they didn't even create a new version for this feature. But they are mostly focused on uh, failover part of a uh, mm, proxy uh, because it's team. Uh, what is the problem of failover? Uh, usually when you want to connect to primary node of a server uh, of Postgres cluster, uh, you are pinning each uh, node in order uh, with a connection timeout. And this is done by each uh, client connection. Using proxy here can save you a time for repeating all over the same work when, uh, when the proxy sees that one node is down, it's not reiterating all over and all over uh, servers again. It just knows that the server is down for now, and uh, when it will return, will be back. It will return it in full. But the problem is connection from the client 
to the uh, proxy is still a network connection and it, will, it can be down too and if uh, proxy goes down uh, clients still have to iterate through different uh, addresses of a proxy uh, we made uh, community not not we not me uh, made some benchmarks against pg bouncer and uh, spqr and pg get uh, for some reason they didn't benchmark the ci i didn't know why uh, and uh, the main takeaway take from these benchmarks was that uh, it, it uh, this lightweight sharding is not adding any latency overheads and more than more than one millisecond so routing can consume up to one millisecond that's, uh, that's where uh, we lose some performance for example if we get back to reconnaissance benchmark benchmarks oh, I should copy that slide Here it is. We see the uh, direct Postgres uh, connection on some workloads can work better than uh, proxy connection. But this is a, a performance when you have a client and server basically on the same machine. You don't lose anything on a, a network latency. Sorry for this slight jumps. Uh, uh, key takeaways. Uh, it's all about performance. PG Bouncer, Odyssey, and other projects exist for one reason solving uh, unexpected performance degradation. Uh, it's not shown on. Uh, even TPCC benchmarks um, tend to uh, avoid waves of hom homogeneous uh, peaks on the database uh, but uh, most of production uh, databases on postgres currently use uh, proxies uh, basic idea of uh, proxy is to pull large number of client connection to small number of server connections uh, this problem must be solved in core one day yeah. Uh, today, Postgres community understands this well, quite well. Many bright people like uh, Andres are working on the problem, uh, but so far in, in Postgres core, the problem persists, and uh, I have no idea when it will be fixed. Uh, one day, we should not have coolers at all. It should just be uh, servers that just work, clusters that just works without any uh, proxies. But now we have to use it. That was all that I wanted to say, and I'd be happy to answer some questions. I will, I will applaud that, everyone else. Uh, thank you for doing this talk. Uh, so we have a few, we have like one minute left for a one talk from the audience. If everyone, or Matt, go for it. Uh, thanks for the talk, Andre. Um, so Odyssey is pretty sophisticated with, with you know user space coroutines and stuff like that. Did you look at anything like, um, DPDK, um, like kernel bypass stuff, or uh, like, or the new, like, I, or something different, like the new IOU ring support for like sockets on like, I mean, that's bleeding edge Linux kernel stuff, but like, would, would, would that help uh, something with, with Odyssey's design or no? Into DPDK. Uh... <laughs> right, you, you, got, you got the short end, repeat what you said. Can you repeat what you said about DVDK? Sorry, it could came wrong. Uh, then I didn't understand the question. Uh, can, Matt, can you repeat the question? Did you did you guys look at anything like DPDK um, with Odyssey, or or more recently, are, are you looking at like IOU ring with socket support on? But that's pretty bleeding edge kernel. Uh, yes, uh, we didn't look into IOU ring. Uh, we we were thinking about uh, moving to closer to to the OS kernel, uh, but uh, our kernel is just too small. This is how uh, Kirill was looking after thinking about DPDK. 
uh, he is fond of all the new stuff. Uh, but uh, we uh, looked at some benchmarks of TLS in uh, in in kernel and understood that it won't be more than twice faster. Uh, the thing is, uh, Odyssey, when it is tuned, is not a bottleneck of, of uh, system. System is, mo is mostly kept by uh, productivity of uh, database itself. It's just, it's just relaying bytes. Uh, and this is the reason why um, PG Bouncer was not, uh, is not multi-threaded still. Because the basic idea is that it's just relaying bytes from here to there, and you should not need too much of a CPU power. And this context switches must not be um, must not be the bottleneck. Yet at some point, I think we will still have to look into IO urine or maybe DPDK. But I, from my point of view, DPDK will be a bigger time investment with uh, unclear benefits. But the That's idea is, is, is good and it's good like uh, when you're doing such stuff, you always want to attract some uh, ICPC students who want to just create a cool code. <laughs> and, and this should work as a marketing tool as to attract some open source developers who want to create some cool, cool code and then they ask to implement some production features. This is uh, completely uh, unrelated, but not existing idea. I, so my last question, Andre, would be: um, I'm assuming at Yandex, you guys never put the proxy on the same box, right? As, as, uh, as the database, as the database server, like you, you can do, you can do like Unix pipes instead of going over TCP. Uh, here, uh, the cool, uh, here is a topology of the cluster, and uh, orange frame is actually for a connection pooler. Uh, we use a uh, connection pooler for on, on the same node as the database stands. Uh, and uh, we, use, um, we use it for high availability fencing too. When we are unsure, should we accept connections or not, we are taking down connection pooler, thus ensuring that no client will reach the database. And uh, it's fast to kill ODC process uh, if for some reason we, we need to do some maintenance work for high availability. Uh, so we usually, usually use ODC on the same machine as database, not on the client side.